Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody. Al Bolowski with another edition of Catholic Spiritualism and Mysticism, where we talk about all things Catholic and the supernatural aspects of our beautiful Catholic faith. And uh, uh, come up that are interesting, and especially today. <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to talk about a topic that's quite relevant um, here as we enter into March. As a matter of fact, the date today, I believe, is March 9th, 2020, <clears throat> and it's hard to uh, not get caught up in the news of the day. And that news of the day, and has been for the last almost two weeks now, the coronavirus, or COVID-19 as it's called, and of course, uh, the fallout from the illness. There's been quite a few deaths, many cases now. There's all kinds of uh, rumors going around, and that is very common at this time. There are rumors that uh, we can't trust the government that they're lying to us, the actual deaths are more, uh, far more than what is being reported. So I guess that would lead to the feeling that there are more cases that are not being reported, uh, that this was not due to uh, eating the pangolin, a uh, protected animal in, in China. Uh, it's considered a delicacy there, and the scales uh, apparently are used in uh, some medicinal purposes, they believe. And the other uh, side of that coin is that Iran and uh, China were working on a joint venture, and uh, this either was a type of biological uh, <clears throat> construction and possibly got away from them and caused all this havoc. Uh, many theories, many things going on out there right now. And, of course, that leads to one side of the faction that uh, gets very upset. Um, They're buying all kinds of uh, products in the grocery store, stocking up on things. Uh, Talk about not going out of your house for, you know, weeks on end until this passes. And then there's the other side of that coin, which uh, people are taking no precautions at all. They're saying it's no big deal. Uh, A lot of people, much more people die from the flu. And uh, don't worry about it. You know, this could be concocted just to uh, maybe even take President Trump down. So a lot of, lot of stuff out there, as they say, and uh, we have to be discerning. And to do that, especially in times like this, we need to have that strong connection to God and uh, prayer life. Um, so I don't know how many people uh, saw Mike Pence, he was on an interview with a news commentator, and that was one of the things he mentioned, his prayer, and that's, uh, you know, he's a deeply religious man. So, he's right on that uh, regard. We need to really connect back to our Creator and pray. And this is one of the reasons we can uh, get discernment and uh, channel that so that we can uh, take any precautions or be wise here. Uh, in our particular uh, circumstances of dealing with this uh, coronavirus. But what we want to point out because of uh, all this reaction is there's another side that believes that could this be from God? It's a means of chastisement, as a means of pulling people back to him. And that's what I want to kind of concentrate on tonight on the show. And again, prayer life, good spiritual director, going to Mass, getting your, getting the sacraments, and your uh, being with God in prayer and praying for the gift of the sermon will take you a very, very, very long way. But we want to do that. Now, there is this uh, mystery uh with the coronavirus, because there's, as I mentioned earlier just a few moments ago, there's theories of how this started. So 
there there's a lot of uh, false information out there. There's a lot of mystery out there, and we've got to be careful when we see, you know, we live in this soundbite age when we're just grabbing those sound bites and not really, you know, paying attention to the facts as, as they're known now. And again, there's a lot of mystery right now. It, it seems we're, uh, and a lot of it, we're trying to throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. But anyway, this is what we do know when we get back to our Lord. That pandemics and plagues, these things have always been considered divine chastisements in history. And the remedy that was taken was that the Catholic Church, church did penance and prayed against them. And that's very important. So I just want to repeat that. That the Catholic Church during these times, when it knew uh, great, great, Plague, such as the bubonic plague, and they strove to be penitent and pray. And one of the stories I want to lead the show in today, uh, now this happened in about the year 590, and this was under the reign of the Catholic Church of Pope Gregory I, and it happened in Rome. And we know that Italy now is uh, being uh, plagued by the coronavirus. It has quite a few outbreaks. Um, there are precautions. We'll talk some about this later that are being taken. But obviously Italy is one of the countries that this is serious. This is a serious matter. Um, and just to sidetrack a little bit before we get back on topic, remember that, that, we don't want to poo-poo all this stuff too much because you do want to be wise a little bit and take precautions. If you've been around people that are sick or you know of people that uh, war around those people and take the recommendations that the government has given us on how to uh, possibly avoid this uh, coronavirus. So with that being said, Italy, between these times, you know, they were devastated by diseases, famines. They had uh, social disorders. And then they had the Lombards come running into town and riding into town. And it was just utter destruction. So they have had, during this time, a pretty tough time. And that's an understatement. So between the years of 589 and 590, they had a plague come upon them. And this particular plague had devastated the Byzantine territory in the east and then the Frankish land in the west. And like any terrible plague, any outbreak, especially during that time, very early in, in history here, uh, a great deal of death, and with that came the terror that human beings experience. And so through this entire peninsula, they're just seeing this incredible plague cut through them, you know, just leaving a trail of death and terror in the peninsula. And then it struck the city of Rome. Now, the Roman citizens saw this epidemic as a divine punishment because of the corruption of the city. So Rome had its share of, of corruption during this time, and this is what they thought was the main reason, that God was going to chastise the people. Now, <clears throat> we'll go back to that a little later, because I want to stay on the story here. Um, the first victim that this plague uh, claimed was in Rome. It was Pope Pelagius II, and he died on February 5th at the year 590. He was buried, of course, in St. Peter's. Now, Obviously, there had to be a new pope, and Gregory became his successor. And he had uh, previously lived in his monk cells in Mount Cecilio, and now he was going to be consecrated. So he was consecrated on October 1st, 1990, as a new pope. And as the new pope, he decided he was going to um, meet this plague head on and quickly. Now, Gregory of Tours, 
he was a contemporary and he chronicled these events. And in a sermon that he wrote down that was quite memorable uh, to him, he delivered it, the Pope uh, Gregory delivered this in the Church of Santa Sabina. And Gregory invited the Romans to follow, to follow what he was going to announce. That now was a time of contrition and penitence. And to look toward that example of the inhabitants of Nineveh. Now remember, Nineveh had to repent. They were very corrupt. And it was a huge town. Some said that it took three days to see. And the prophet had given them the warning that they were to turn from their evil ways and come back to, to God, to turn to ashes and sackcloth. And they didn't have a lot of time. And if they didn't, they would be completely destroyed. And we know what happened. And that God withheld that, that um, chastisement, that punishment, because they did. Not just that, but the animals were even going to have to be uh, put in this uh, penitent atmosphere of the sackcloth and ashes. He said, to look around, you behold God's sword of wrath brandished over the entire population. <clears throat> he said, the sudden death snatches us from the world, scarcely gives us a second of time. And many of us have seen this, right? We've seen that in our, unfortunately, families, friends. You certainly see it in the news if you uh, watch the news. And <clears throat> the Pope was worried because... So many people at that moment are taken up by evil. And they were all around this area, taken up by evil. And they were unable to even think about what he wanted, and that was being to be penitent. And that frustrated him, but he did not give up. Because Pope Gregory exhorted everyone, everyone, to raise their eyes to God, who he said permits such tremendous punishments in order to correct his children, to correct his children. Now, to placate the divine wrath, the Pope had ordered a seven-form litany, and that came in, is a procession of the entire Roman population, and it was divided into seven cordages, according to uh, whether they were male or female, the age and condition. So the procession moved from the various Roman churches toward the Vatican Basilica. And they sang these people litanies along the entire way. And you might realize this, but this was the beginning of what we do today of our greatest litanies of the church, whether it be litany the Sacred Heart of Jesus, litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary, litany uh, to St. Joseph, litany to the saint. We'll see that soon as we come to Easter. It's so beautiful. And they're called rogations. And what that is is we pray to God that he may defend us from adversities. So they moved through the buildings of ancient Rome. They were barefoot. And they went at a slow pace. This was going to be a slow, slow prayer one with great reverence, with great contrition. Their heads were covered in ashes. And the multitude, they went in the city, they traversed through the city in a silence that almost resembled a burial tomb. And this pestilence, this plague, was so devastating, and it reached such a point of devastation that in a brief space of an hour, while they're doing this now, 80 people fell dead to the ground. But that, that did not stop Gregory. He didn't stop for a second in urging the people to continue to pray. And then he insisted that a picture of the Virgin Mary painted by St. Luke and kept in Santa Maria Maggiore, be brought forth 
in front of that procession. So he demands this. He wants the picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary to be brought out so that they can be, it can be put in front of these penitents. And we're singing these litanies as they traverse through the city. Now, as the holy image advanced, the air became healthier and more limpid, and the plague started to dissolve as if it couldn't stand the presence of that holy image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So just think about it. The air became healthier and more limpid. And that part of the play dissolved as if it couldn't stand its presence. And they reached the bridge which united the city to the Hadrian Mausoleum. And all of a sudden, brothers and sisters, a chorus of angels could be hearing singing. The Regina Celle, La Terre, Hallelujah, Queen of Heaven, Rejoice. It's a beautiful, and again, we do that during Easter. Resurrexi Sikudixi, Hallelujah. And Gregory responded, Ora pro nobis, rogamus, hallelujah. And you might have guessed it, that's how the Regina Celli was born. And that is, of course, the answer found that the church greet Mary, the Queen, during Easter, during our celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they hear this singing. And after the singing... The angels set of themselves in a circle around Our Lady's pictures. And Gregory, raising his eyes, saw at the top of this castle, this Hadrian mausoleum, an angel who was drawing his sword, which was dripping with blood, and the angel was drawing it. And he put it back in its sheath. And they knew right then and there that that was a sign that the punishment was over. So penitent people, penitent people that were contrite and humbled in heart and humbled in spirit, and these penitents marching around the city, and then an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary is brought forth to be led as these penitents traverse that city. And angels are heard singing the Regina Celle. And an angel is seen above the castle with his sword dripping with blood, drying it, putting it back in its seat. Then the great plague was over. Now, Pope Gregory I was canonized and became a doctor of the church. And, of course, you may have recognized, because there's a word that goes in front of Pope Gregory, and that's what we call the great. And after he died, Romans began calling the Hadrian Mausoleum, Susan Mausoleum, Castel Sant'Angelo, because that was in remembrance of the miracle placed at the top of the castle, a statue of St. Michael. And he's, around his head, he's, he uh, has heavy uh, military gear that the statue portrays. And he's in the act, of course, of sheathing his sword. And even today, in the Capitoline Museum, there's a circular stone uh, that you can see with footprints, which, according to the tradition, was left by the archangel when he stood to declare the end of the plague. And we have a witness of Cardinal uh, Cesar Baronio, 
Uh, he lived from 1538 to 1697, and he is considered one of the great historians of the Catholic Church, with, uh, known for his rigorous research. And he confirmed through this research that the appar apparition of the angel was on top of that castle. So, thanks to St. Gregory's appeal to heaven, and the angel seizing that sword. It means what? That that sword had to be used to punish the sins of the Roman people. Now, we know that angels, and we know this from scripture, are the agents of divine punishments on people. And we can see this in the third seek of the Fatima, right? With an angel having a flaming sword, it's giving out flames, and they look as if it's going to set the world on fire. And it, the angel calls out, penance, 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 right? But before these flames set the world on fire, Our Lady, again, her image uh, being out in front of those penitents that... Uh, we're asking the Lord to end the plague. Our Lady in the third secret of Fatima, light radiated from her hands and it pointed to the earth and stopped that uh, fire. So these things with some people, of course, will say, well, that, that didn't really happen. That's just some kind of myth. But as we've talked about many times on the show, remember, in every myth, there is truth. There is truth. And I know that some people um, are very put out by the fact that God punishes or uses chastisements to correct us to come back to him. And especially in the day and age we live now, because... It's very common for us today, and you see this, that Jesus is not the strong warrior that he was or is, of course, and is the, and the Gospels tell us. There are many people that have taken Jesus and turned him into some type of milk toast um, prophet that was a real nice guy. And he may not even be God, but, you know, we really kind of should listen because he had some pretty good ideas. And that is totally, totally uh, contrary to what the Gospels portray, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the strongest uh, person we ever know. He's relevant in our lives today as he was when he walked the earth in the Gospels. And he's anything but milk toast. He is a warrior, and God is often portrayed in the Old Testament as a warrior. Remember, the Old Testament and the New Testament and with the Catholic Church are combined. They are not distinct. They're not separate. There's not, well, the Old Testament, that was the Jewish people back there with Exodus and Genesis and Leviticus and all that. It doesn't really portray or pertain to us today in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they do. Because the Old Testament always points and leads the way to the New Testament, to Jesus, to the Savior, to salvation history through him. So we can't separate the Old Testament. We know that God is the same. He, is, he doesn't change. So when God is called a warrior in Scripture, we must believe it. Now, what that all has to get to the point is that Jesus, in Scripture, in especially that Old Testament, has corrected his people. There were ten plagues that we know. We're going to try and get to this on the show today. There were ten plagues that we know that were able to let Moses and the Jewish people be freed from the yoke of slavery from Pharaoh and Egypt. And we know this. And we see constantly that God 
does correct his children. And it's very difficult right now because we're living in an age that there is a great deal of skepticism. There is a great deal of questioning. And there is a great deal of doubt and disbelief. And this is one of the reasons why we don't see so, of so many of the miracles that are portrayed in the gospel in the Old Testament. Because we question and we doubt. Remember, Jesus in his hometown could not do great things because they consider him, hey, he's just one of us. How can he be doing these things? And a prophet, right, is, has no honor in his own town. They're used to him. And we live in a society today that is throwing God out and that we doubt in faith. And these miracles that we seek, they're there and we can see them because they're happening. But if they don't happen as much as during uh, the time, the ancient times, those folks believe a great deal more than we do. Especially during the Middle Ages. Everything they did was connected to God. Everything. Everything. And so to say that God doesn't correct probably isn't really a, a, good, uh, a good way to look at all these things when things happen. Now, that being said, we can't look at everything that happens in the world and think that this is a correction from Jesus. Okay? So we want to make that point that not everything that happens in the world is a correction from Jesus. You and I, with our free will, have a great deal to do with the calamities that appear to harm not only human beings, but creation itself. And our sin does that. So we have the free will to change all the conditions of poverty and misery and good stewardship of the environment, but we don't do these things. And there are consequences to sin. We talked about that on the show. Our sin is social. And your sin and my sin doesn't just affect uh, you and me, but everyone, society, it's social. So some of the things that happen to human beings in this environment, in this great planet that God created the earth, happen because of our choice, but not everything. And we know this because of Scripture and what God has used to bring his children back to him, whether they be the Israelites or even here when we look and look at this plague that hit Italy. And again, I just want to make this point. I am not saying that the coronavirus is, is a divine chastisement. Time will show all of this. Because again, you look at, if it is um, the pangolin, it's an armadillo-like animal that is protected actually as a species. If it is being trafficked and it is being eaten and these things are off limits and we do them, then that's our free will. Because if this is an environmental issue, the coronavirus, and it very uh, may well be, then that is our free choices to poach, if it is an animal, these animals, even though they're protected, to sell them, to eat them, to use the scales, whatever. And then there's ramifications. And the ramifications are when we break the connection between the environment of what God created, his creation, and each other and God, we will pay. So God lets, in our free will choices, he permits things to happen. In, to quote the, the Sinatra song, My Way, he'll let us do it our way. And our way may not even be close to the best way, and we've seen this throughout our history, that our way usually has some pretty devastating consequences for humanity and creation. 
So we want to point those things out because, again, there's a lot of talk. A lot of people, you know, believe that, um, that this is a correction from God. And if it is, eventually history will, will pay this out. But for now, we should take St. Gregory the Great's um, plea in our hearts in our society. Because what he said was, what will, what will we say of the terrible events of, w- of which we are witnesses if not that they are predictions of a future wrath? And he said, thanks, then, dearest brothers, for the extreme care to that day. Correct your lives, change your habits, defeat with all your might the temptations of evil, punish with tears, sins committed. And that's very good advice for us today. Because we've talked about this on other shows. You know, we've done some end time shows. And eventually, there will be a judgment day. And we don't know when. But it isn't going to be pretty. That we do know. Because that's going to be the final battle. That is going to be all she wrote. Where everything passes away, there will be a new heaven, a new earth created. The righteous will go and live forever in paradise. And those that chose to say no, they will have a resting, well, resting wouldn't be the word to use, but a place with Satan and his demons. And that's something we have to be aware of. And we don't want to even think about. Many people do not want to think about this today. But that's what this is. You know, our, our show is Catholic mysticism. We talk about the supernatural. This is all cosmic. All these things are on a cosmic level, whether there are choices from our free will and the sins that we commit and the fallout from that sin that affects each and every one of us, not only individually, but socially, as a community. And when these things happen, it's all on this cosmic level. And if it is a divine uh, correction from God, well, then it is. And it's for our own good, and it won't be pleasurable because God can either whisper to us or shout. And we want him to whisper. We don't want to shout. You know, we need to listen to Pope Gregory the Great's words about that prayer and that penance, because that's the other part that goes, is that we've got to be sorry for these things, and we've got to be be penitent and humble, because when you look at the coronavirus in the fall, let's just take Wall Street, for instance, and we have a God that is money, that the stock market could almost be looked at upon for some people as a God, and that's going to be corrected. You know, eventually that has to happen anyway. That's economics. And so many people today put their faith in that. And what happens if it all goes by the wayside? We're in trouble. And the people that put their faith in that are in trouble. And when things like that do happen, and I think most of us can remember that on that September, when when the terrorists attacked, September 11th, 2001, well, boy, did people have a different outlook. The churches were packed, confessionals. Christmas wasn't so much about spending and getting toys and presents, but about having those around us, those we love, still there and appreciating life. So a very, very uh, important part of that correction is for us to come back to God. And if we do that through our own free will, Rather than being corrected by him, it's going to be a lot easier. But we will see again how this pays out. Again, you know, I don't want to, um, on this particular show, give the impression that this is all from God and um, not our own choices or, you know, something like that. So I I just want to, again, make that perfectly clear. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that throughout Scripture, God has corrected uh, his people. 
And I'd like to talk a little bit about that now through the Old Testament because we're very familiar with it, and that's the plagues of Egypt. Now, most of us know, whether we're followers of the faith or even if we saw the Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, that there were ten calamities, ten plagues that were inflicted on the Egyptians. And why was that? Because Pharaoh would not let the Israelites leave Egypt, period. They wanted that labor. They were conquered people. They were nothing. And they're going nowhere because my economy isn't going to fall. I need labor. And we're not paying for it. And we've got these people. And when Moses went to Pharaoh and told him God's will, what did that do? No. He, Pharaoh, got very, very aggravated. And he made what? He made the condition of the Israelites even worse. And even though, even though God had changed Aaron's rod into a serpent, and that was proof that Moses had a divine mission from God, it made no impression. Because why? Because Again, cosmic battle, spiritual battle from the beginning of this time that we know, this battle between Satan and God and St. Michael, the one that sheathed that sword for the plague with St. Gregory in the story we just told, threw Satan and a third of those angels out of heaven. And they had their own kingdom in hell. So, again... This spiritual battle, the Egyptian magicians copy. So they didn't think that was any great shakes. But Pharaoh was sadly mistaken. Because there were going to be ten plagues. And they would work through Moses and Aaron or Moses by himself. And then three of them, the fourth, fifth, and tenth plague were from the direct action of God Almighty. Now, we know that these last four plagues probably followed in close succession. Probably what they feel is the beginning of March, which we're in, and the first days of April. Because when the hail fell, barley was getting ready in the air and the flax was in bud. And in lower Egypt, that usually happens around March. And we know that the Israelites left on the 14th of Nisan, which falls on the latter part of March or the beginning of early April. So we look at that and then we see that the first six seem also to have come one after another at short intervals. But the point here is that God orchestrated this and he did it to knock the ab- that Pharaoh's was so obstinate that he was going to change him. And our scriptural account, of course, shows that the plagues were a series of blows in quick succession. Because this is what would have required. Remember, even after the last plague, even after Pharaoh let Moses and his people go, he still had a stone heart where he said, no, I made a mistake. I'm going to kill them. And even with the death of his firstborn, and he was broken, he hardened his heart enough to change his mind that he was going to destroy them. Now, in the first plague, we know that the water of the river and all the canals and all the pools of Egypt turned to blood. And, of course, becoming blood, the Egyptians could not drink it. They couldn't eat the fish because they died. And God shows this to show who he is is in control. And not only does he do this and change that water. 
into blood, but they can't use any of that life-giving water, which was so in, uh, important to them. So that was the first plague. And we know, you know, there's so many, remember we said that the Old Testament is a bridge to the New. And um, we see here that this water, we know that this water was changed to blood. And this was one of the things that was going to start the Egyptians on a road where they were going to let the Israelites leave. And we know then St. Longinus sword pierced Christ what came out? Water and blood. A baptism that freed us from the yoke. The yoke of bondage that we were under so that we could be saved and the gates of heaven would be opened again. Now, the second plague, right, was the immense number of frogs. And it covered the land and penetrated the land and it caused a great deal of uh, comfort to the Egyptians. Now think about that. It sounds kind of almost humorous, but think about that. If tons and tons and tons of frogs started in your neighborhood and got in your house and hopping around, and it seemed that the floor was moving because there were so many frogs, and the noise would not stop, and you would be pretty upset pretty quick. So this was not a good plague. It's not a humorous plague. This would be very devastating. Now, Pharaoh starts to relent a little here, right? Because he said, you know, you guys, here's what you can do. I'll, I'll let you guys go a little bit, but out in the desert. That you can go do your religious sacrifices if, um, if the frogs, you get rid of them. And they did. But, of course, Pharaoh, hard-hearted, broke that promise. Now, the third plague was swarms of gnats. Now, anybody that spent any time in the woods, camping or anything, especially the deep woods, knows just how difficult those insects can be. And they are uh, aggravating is, a, is, boy, that's an understatement. Now, those magicians that were able to copy Aaron's rod being turned into a serpent, well, this one here, they couldn't copy. And even they told Pharaoh, you know, this is the finger of God. So now we're starting to see some hearts being moved. Now the fourth was the flies. And you can imagine that if flies were inside, infested in your house, infested outside everywhere you went, landing on you, landing on your food, your pets, your everything, seeing just walls of flies on your windows, Definitely concerned. Definitely concerned. And Pharaoh now says, you know what? You guys can go out in the desert for three days after Moses gets rid of these flies. But he also failed to keep that promise. And then the fifth was cattle pest. And this killed the beasts of the Egyptians. Yet, the beasts that the Israelites had were spared. So now the Egyptians are really starting to suffer now. Not just with insects, it's not water, the fish, shot, now what they eat, they're in trouble. The sixth plague was the boils, and that broke out on the men and the beasts. Not a pretty sight. Then the seventh was that fearful hailstorm. And the hail, we are told, destroyed... Uh, throughout all the land of Egypt, all the things that were in the field, man, beast, it didn't matter. Every herb, every tree was broken. Only in the land of Jessen, where the children of Israel wore, the hail did not fall. Now again, Pharaoh, he's frightened now, but he promises some promises, and again, he doesn't come through. How many times do we see that? So, the eighth plague, and we're seeing this now in our own time, uh, is locusts. And 
Now, even Pharaoh's servants are seeing all this happening. And again, this is in quick succession. They intercede. And they, he starts to let Pharaoh, starts to let some men go. But he doesn't, he's not going to let everybody go. A few. Because these servants, they, they wanted to go. They saw this and they said, hey, you know what? How about, how about doing us a favor? But not all. He didn't let all go. A few. And then Moses, we know, stretched forth his rod. And this south wind brought so many locusts that they devoured anything that the hailstorm had left. And they're out of everything now. And then the ninth plague. A horrible darkness which for three days covered all of Egypt, again, except the land of Jesson, where the Israelites were. And Pharaoh now, he's willing to let him go. But he said, you know, and he insisted, you got to leave your animals, you got to leave your flocks, because, you know, we don't have anything. And I want those. And then, of course, the final, the most destructive, and the most painful blow, the destruction in one night of all the firstborn of Egypt. And then we know, as I mentioned just moments earlier, that Pharaoh did decide to let all of Egypt go, all, excuse me, all of the uh, Israelites to go, all their animals, and he changed his mind, and then they chased him. And they were, Pharaoh, his army, and they were told the charities, all of them. Once they were trapped where Moses had parted the Red Sea, they were destroyed themselves. Now, I talked, I wanted to talk about the plagues in Scripture um, to show that God does act. He does act. And we need discernment. But history will bear out what came from God as chastisements, what came from sin, and our free will choices. Because there are many who look at the plagues in Egypt and they find parallel with that in the natural phenomena of that country. And I mention about doubt and faith. And they don't believe that they were merely natural occurrences. Now, when you look at the ten plagues, you can start to spin that any way you want. The tenth plague, with the angel of death and the firstborn of the Egyptians killed, including Pharaoh's own son, that's not natural. And... Famine, pandemic, pestilences, Spanish flu, whatever it was, they don't select victims. They're pretty democratic when it comes to that. But the firstborn killed in Egypt, they were selected. So that's not natural. And for anyone that argues that it could be just natural occurrences common with that country. When you look at scripture, you have to see by the reason of the manner that these were produced, to say that they were mirac not miraculous is really fooling themselves. Because they belong to a class of miracles which theologians call preternatural. Because to, to fail to mention that they were of an extraordinary intensity, extraordinary, and that the first occurred at such an unusual time and place and had such unusual effects, and they, they were predicted at the exact time and in the exact manner. And that's hard to get around. And the other point that that's hard to get around is that most of them were produced at Moses' command, and they ceased at his prayer. So for the naysayers, 
you have these extraordinary intensive, intensified plagues that occur at unusual time and place with unusual effects that, exact, that happen exactly at the time and manner that they were predicted to happen. And then upon an individual's command, which he called forth, and then they ceased when he prayed. And one of these cases was a time set by Pharaoh. He was the one that dictated the time to cease. So natural phenomena, please, it should be clear. It should be clear. Do not occur under such conditions. And the other part I'd like to mention is that if this was ordinary phenomena that the Egyptians were used to because they had witnessed this before and they were well known by the Egyptians, how did they leave such a deep impression on Pharaoh and his court to let Moses and his people go? So to try to downplay these is a grave injustice. And we see at that time that there were people that did this. But eventually, oh, did they come to believe. And we see in our own time that there are people that will try, using scientific method or scientific reasoning, explain everything away. Everything. And that just isn't the case. Brothers and sisters, I know you know that. Science deals with the material world. It can't delve into the soul, the spirit, beauty, love. So many things are that call in our soul to God that there should be. Deep in us, we know this. There should be. Something's not right here. Something's out of tune. That our souls yearn for more. Our souls yearn for righteousness and justice and beauty and love and goodness and peace. And we know that because we live in a world that doesn't have a lot of peace, a lot of justice. That beauty sometimes is transfigured into something ugly. And we miss it. We miss the beauty of creation in many things. And I mentioned that um, the coronavirus could be very well a product of the way we are treating God's creation. Now, we did a, a program a couple shows ago on Laudato C and the connection between God, human beings, and creation. And this was before the coronavirus. And we had talked a little bit about um, the consequences of not being good stewards. And um, we're seeing a lot of that now. Now, what we need to do, as, as what we mentioned at the beginning of the show, is we need to have some humility. We need to be humble. And we need to be Practice our penance, to be penitent, and to pray and ask for that discernment. That's our spiritual side, because that's where this comes. God hears our prayer, and if we are truly humble, remember what he said in Second Chronicles, that he will hear our prayer, and if we repent from our evil ways and change them, he will heal nations, he will heal the land. That's a promise by God, and we can count on those promises. But we have to do our part. And this Lent is a good time to think about all these things. Because we need to look at this from, with a spiritual eye, from the eye of eternity, as they say, and see the cosmic battle here, because this is all part of the cosmic battle. Because even in the end result, remember, even if we war through all our social programs, if we brought, brought peace on earth, if we ended world poverty, there was no more violence, we're still going to die. 
even if it was a so-called paradise on earth, we're still going to die. And that means we're going to live forever somewhere. And at the end of time, it will be two places, heaven and hell. And before that, we have purgatory to cleanse the soul. A great gift from God is purgatory because our souls have to be immaculately clean before we get to heaven. And purgatory will purge us from the things that we retain. And that's a gift from God. shouldn't be feared. It should be a gift. Be grateful. Should be grateful for that gift. Because it is a great gift to get us to him. His mercy is so great we cannot fathom it. And on a temporal side, we need to take some precautions. If you have symptoms, you stay home. If you're not feeling good, you get tested. They're going to have test packets. You practice good hygiene. If you're concerned and, and you've had this, this cough that now becomes a deep, nagging cough, very deep, then you call your health care provider and ask for the test. And don't come in contact with people. You know, the, the, the bishops are asking in the state I live, they're, they're taking some precautions. Some people may be a little upset, think it's overdone. But it's okay to err on the side of safety. It's okay. Nothing wrong with that. That's being wise. That's being prudent. It's one of the cardinal virtues, right? Prudent. So we need to show some of those precautions. And, you know, um, while we want to be cautious, we don't want to overreact either because panic, panic causes a, a great deal of calamity. You know, one thing, if the people are hoarding medications and they are hoarding certain things, you know, for people that need it, it it's not going to be good for them. And we, we do have to be our brother, sister, and keeper. We do. That's all part of being connected um, to God, each other, and his creation. So we just can't exploit, and, you know, hooray for me and the heck with you and uh, just look out for ourselves. But we take those precautions in times like this but always, you know, when things are tough, whether it's an individual um, circumstance in our life or whether it's communal like what's happening now with uh, the virus and, and Wall Street and so many things happening now, um, kind of riding in this perfect storm of calamity, remember that we can trust in God. He has, whether it's for people as a whole or our individual lives, he only has his, our good as his primary concern. And that's a promise that we can count on. And as a Catholic, if we're receiving him in the Eucharist and we're making our confession and, you know, we have a good prayer life and we're trying and do the best we can, we're in a pretty good spot. We're in a pretty good spot. Because one of the things we've got to be careful of in today's modern world with such incredible advancements and, and, and great, uh, great things that happen with technology is that we don't think that uh, we are God and can control our lives and our, our, our demise and that we can do this. Because that's not going to happen, brothers and sisters. All of us are going to pass. All of us will sit in the judgment seat. And all of us will live again. And it's just where. And if we're living right and trying to do what God asks, then we really don't have anything to fear. Nothing. Nothing. Because if St. Paul tells us, when we do pass, it will be a twinkle of an eye, and we'll be on the other side. And if we're with God in paradise, with our loved ones, and his creatures and creation, and it'll be forever and ever and ever, no more tears, no more separation, forever. Love, peace, joy, and beauty, all the things our souls yearn for will finally be fulfilled in eternity that will never end. And that is the important part to keep in mind. So brothers and sisters, fear not, keep your faith, in the one that created us. For he has told us himself, 
He has went and prepared a place for us. And if he did not do so, he would not have told us. Good night, and God bless. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.